Hello. <laughs> hey, what's up? I'm in the ice bath. Hey. Sorry, um, you're, you're, um, I don't have my ice bath. Um, I wasn't sure like what, what to do, but um, I'm still moving stuff into my apartment, so I can't participate in the ice bath. <laughs> okay, I'll definitely have you in mind here in Israel. Anyways. Okay, so awesome. We started, all right, so welcome to the show. I'll introduce myself to you and uh, to our viewers. I'm Sean, I currently live in Israel. And I am a strength and conditioning coach. I work, more, I know you don't like the word conditioning. You like the word speed better. I did some uh, stalking on your Instagram. And I am currently working with Team Israel Flag <laughs> Football, both men and women. And I loved your philosophy. I loved your ideas. I saw what you're putting out there. So I'm really honored to have you on the show. And if you could introduce yourself. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. I know we've been trying to make this happen for a while. Uh -huh. So I'm I'm just like super pumped to just dive in. I know you and I align a lot uh, in our philosophies as far as performance and just building the complete athlete and human. So this will be good. All right. So why don't you, without further ado, can you please tell us who you are, what you do, where you live, what you specialize in? Sure. Yeah. You know, now that I'm about nine years into this, I don't even know what to call myself anymore <laughs> <laughs> because it's just evolved so much. Um, so I'll just go back to when I started. I was initially a skills trainer for youth soccer players. So working on more of the technical side of the game, um, shooting, 1v1 moves, passing, all of the, the stuff with the ball. And then about a year into that, I realized that a lot of these kids were getting overuse injury, um, ACL stats were starting to go up even more. And I was just looking around the, the youth soccer world and just asking, well, what do these kids need? And I found that they weren't getting a lot of the general physical preparation work. So the, the speed development, the, the total body strength, working on how to decelerate and control their bodies, especially with um, like non-contact ACLs. There were a lot of those happening and a lot of those occur from a quick deceleration or a cut or change of direction. So uh, back in 2013, I decided to go all in with strength and conditioning, got certified, started working at a performance facility, and I was there for several years. And I am now starting to just grow the performance side more into the, the mental and the emotional side of it and not just the physical because I started seeing some of my strongest girls getting injured. And I'm like, well, what's going on with that? Um, so it's just been a continuous puzzle to solve. So now I guess I would say I'm more of a human performance coach. <laughs> <laughs> I usually use the word performance coach as well, but people are like, what's a performance coach? You know, there's so many, we yeah. have kind of have, as be, as being performance coaches, we always have to categorize ourselves in this box. Wait, so you work with them in the field or you work with them in the gym or you teach them how to, you know, shoot a ball. There's no like clear cut line. Before we delve into today's topic, because you mentioned that you transitioned from being like a soccer skill specific coach to a strength. By the way, is the audio good? Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I can hear so, you. Yep. Awesome. So before we delve into today's topic, you mentioned that you delved from being a soccer skill specific coach to a strength and speed and performance and mental coach. So do you believe here in Israel, there's a huge problem and there's not enough strength and conditioning coaches working with athletes and it's all early specialization. So you're taking an eight year old, you're making him the best soccer player in the world and he gets to 18 and his career is over because he has no athleticism uh, built yet. Super common here in Israel. I'm not sure what it's like in Florida or yes, Florida, right? You just moved to Florida yes. at the moment. But do you believe that every skilled coach should also be a strength and conditioning coach or at least have some strength and conditioning knowledge and vice versa. Every strength and conditioning or performance coach should have the base knowledge of the sport that he is uh, coaching or teaching in. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think every skills coach should have a, a basic knowledge um, because it's so valuable to incorporate this stuff into their session. So it is very similar out here to where you are at. And I think all over the world, 
with early specialization. And I, I'm not totally against it. I'm against, that's the only thing the child's doing. So they're just doing their sport and they're not getting uh, play within the neighborhood or on the playground, or they're not doing general physical preparation to really build their entire body. So if we look at the, just the average youth soccer schedule, for example, in America, it's at minimum three practices a week. And then that fourth day might be a game. That fifth day might be with their skills trainer. So when we look at what the body's doing in, in all those days, they're, they're overusing the hip flexors, quads, um, and they're just more anteriorly dominated. And what's happening is they're, they're not strong enough in other parts of their body. That's going to make them resilient to knee injury or helping them improve stability of the knee or being able to control their momentum or just have body awareness. Um, and I, I just talked to a physical therapist about concussions and concussions are not necessarily a neck strength issue, but it's just not having awareness of your surroundings and being able to react quickly or like scan the field. And if kids are doing soccer all the time, their focus is so at their feet. Whereas if they would be playing other sports like basketball or tennis or handball, they'd be getting more of that, um, that awareness and their head being more up. And that's only going to enhance those soccer specific skills, like being able to see the field well and react and be, be agile. So I'm a huge proponent of every kid needs to become really amazing athletes, but they can do both. They can become really good athletes and really good soccer players at the same time. It doesn't need to be this black or white, like, oh, early specialization's bad. It's like, no, we can have it all, but everyone needs to have the education. Wow, that's a really fascinating way to put it. I remember when I was working with the soccer academy here in Israel, so they gave me like a corner of the field. They're like, all right, you have 15 minutes. So I said to him, 15 minutes once a week. Hmm, that's going to be really effective. But I managed to wiggle it to efficient. I said, okay, let's make a deal. I'm allowed to give them the warm up. So during the warm up, you know, we put some dynamic mobility work and stability, rate of force development, landing mechanics, accelerating, deaccelerating. And as far as this coaching concerned, who unfortunately didn't have any knowledge in the strength and performance world is like, oh, it's a great warm up. So I got to sneak in like 15, 20 minutes for the kids before their soccer skill session. And then I said, how about you send me six kids at a time for 15 minutes? I'll do some basic movement patterns with them and I'll put them back on the field and they can work their skill work. So I managed to get 50 minutes, but very high quality four to six athletes at a time instead of trying to teach 20 kids how to squat at once. So that was my genius idea to work with the kids. Like I, I, I agree with what you're saying that you do need to teach the kids the ball skill, just because they're an athlete doesn't mean that they'll be a good soccer player or football player, depending on where you are in the world. But it has to be like balanced out as they grow as players. And what they're lacking, what I feel is what they're lacking in more, at least in my field, is the athleticism. So it's not take away from their ball skills, but hey, let's build up their athleticism in, in line and in parallel with their ball skills. Mm hmm. Yeah, and that's a great point uh, as far as sneaking it in. Um, and the warm up is the best way to do that. And that's when like parents and coaches don't realize you're like actually giving the kids what they need. And I've, I've used this so many times, like, you know, I'll still do like a little bit of skills, but the warm up to that session is for, is going to be like 15 minutes, no ball. We're working on skipping patterns, um, squatting, bear crawling, crab walking, uh, playing ankle tag, or just like things that just aren't their sport. And then it's like, okay, well, that was the warm up. Let's, we'll do the actual session here. And no one even notices. And that's, that's the best way to do it, which I think it's good that skills trainers have uh, an understanding of the long-term athletic development model and what the basic motor skills are and what the movement patterns are that kids need. So eventually when they get into high school and they start to specialize, then we can, oh, my alarm's going off. Then we can start to load them up and get them strength training in the gym. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I kind of look at it like a linear model. Like I look at the eight-year-old kids that I've worked with and I also work with, you know, 20-year-old athletes. And I say, you know, like training age, right? So 
<laughs> in Israel, you get 18 to 30 year olds whose training age is zero. They've never touched a dumbbell, barbell, kettlebell before. So yeah. I can't load him up in any form or manner. In fact, this person doesn't even, this he or her does not even know how to squat with a barbell. If you teach the kid at eight years old, that fundamental movement pattern, you know, squat, hinge, push something overhead, how to brace correctly, how to diaphragmic breathe, how to keep his neck stable, like you were mentioning with the concussions, you don't even have to load up a gajillion, kilo, well, we use kilo here in Israel, but you don't have to load up a gajillion pounds, just teach him the squat that when he's 15 and he go and he gets to the weight room and or 12, whenever it is, and the strength coach says, here's a squat, he's like, yeah, I did this on the field, I remember. And then it just kind of progresses from there. That's, that's my... Uh, yeah methodology anyways uh what i want to delve in today with you and i think you're really the perfect role you're a role model for me as well by the way even though we've only met through instagram i think you're the perfect <laughs> role model for it is really building the wholesome holistic athlete not just in the gym or the field court turf whatever it may be but actually building them outside the field as well what do they do in their daily life are they sitting a lot do they have a spiritual practice do they have a meditation practice now the, the purists among us coaches will be like, what do you mean? Who says meditating gets them better? But it's not about that. It's about you're a human being, I'm a human being, and we are role models for other human beings. So if we're just going to be like gung-ho and be like, all right, eat your macros, bro, and do your power cleans and go play sports, you know, we're not creating human beings. But, but as I said before, we're building human beings. So we have to add the humane side to it. And I've had so many kids and athletes who look up to me and I'm sure your athletes adore you as well. So it's important that we teach them, educate them and internalize it and practice ourselves. So without further ado, what non-gym and non, you know, field work or even skill work essentials would you say that you would have your athletes or encourage your athletes to be doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love diving into this. This is something I've just uh, blossomed into in the past couple of years. And, you know, it might have been because of my own journey, but also just what I've observed. Um, and with my athletes, what I've seen, especially early in my career, was again, like my strongest and fastest girls, they, some of them would crack under pressure or not perform well during the game. Like they do great in the weight room with me and be like so on, but then on the field, they're not, they're not performing at their best. Or um, I might have a girl who's strength training, but you know, she's still getting stress fractures and overuse injuries. So then I was like, wait a minute, what, what else is going on here? Because we all know the benefits of, of loading and strength training. Okay, so strong bones, stronger muscles, uh, better acceleration, better speed, and all these performance aspects. But then it's like, okay, if you're strength training a lot, but maybe you're not getting the nourishment you need like vitamin D and calcium, you're going to be more susceptible to stress fractures. And I've had girls that's happened to, and I failed as a coach because I wasn't educated back then on the nutrition side of it. And now nutrition is an ongoing part of our, our discussion and our sessions. And it, it's to the point where I have to be repetitive in my messaging, almost annoying with them because the more they hear it and the more I lead by example, the more they start to nourish and fuel their bodies accordingly. Um, other things that we work on are meditation and recovery. And I'm really big on recovery and self-care right now. And I think it's been my own personal journey because back in 2018, when I was just overworking myself and coaching all the time and never taking time for myself, it, all that stress accumulated and it caused me to suffer panic attacks and to the point where I had to go to the emergency room. So then I was like, wait a minute, like I'm, I'm not practicing what I preach to my athletes. And I need to understand that if their nervous systems are constantly overstimulated or they're, they're overthinking, then yeah, no wonder come game time, they're cracking under pressure or their muscles aren't firing in, in the way I want them to fire because they didn't get any of their recovery. So uh, we talk a lot about meditation. It's sometimes their most favorite part of the session is when we take five minutes to just breathe. Uh, we talk a lot about just sleep hacks and making sure they're getting sunlight, they're dimming the, the lights at night before bed, maybe they're taking a cold shower or they're putting their feet up or they're doing some slow belly breathing before bed so they sleep better. And um, those are the main pieces where the athlete becomes their most powerful. 
So my, my mantra now is an athlete is as strong and powerful as their recovery routine. All of the magic happens during their recovery. That's when they're able to perform and to be able to think quicker and be sharper on the field. It happens during their, their sleep, their meditation. So this is all an absolute non-negotiable for me as a coach to continue to have these discussions. <laughs> wow. I, I, amazing. I, I really resonate with everything you said. It's funny because I don't know if you're familiar with like the Wim Hof method. But, I love you know, Wim Hof. Yeah, that's yeah. why I'm in, that's yeah. why I'm in an ice bath right now. So yeah. <laughs> same thing as me. As I grew as a human being, I was able to carry over the practices that I took upon myself to my athletes. So when I began adding Wim Hof daily, I was like, hmm, this is doing amazing things for me. Let me do it for my athletes as well. So obviously depending on timing, but now most of my athletes will do a quick like five to 10 minute breathing session somewhere within the workout. And it could also obviously depend on how he's how he or she is feeling how much time we have if we only have 45 minutes maybe i'll you know do some mobility and go straight into strength but if we have a longer session then i'll definitely add some uh, mindfulness some journaling i think that i don't like to i don't like to put things in a box but i would say there's two kind of things you can do outside the weight rooms there's things that will directly affect your recovery and performance like nutrition sleeping properly hydration and then there's this th things which you may not directly see the carryover, such as, you know, mindfulness, journaling, spending some time in sunshine, but it's definitely doing wonders for your body and repairing your system without you essentially realizing. So I used, usually, you know, like the whole concept of uh, rest days versus active recovery days. So an active recovery day could be in the gym, but it can also be in the park with loved ones, in the sunshine, exposing yourself to earth, playing with your dog. And you can weigh them both and say, okay, well, he's in the gym, he or she, I keep on saying he, uh, sorry, I'm reverting to it. Yeah. Uh, he, she, it, they, frog, whatever they may be. Uh, that's a different conversation for, for previous podcasts. Um, yeah. Are in the gym and, you know, they're doing fundamental movement patterns with a light weight, which might be great for them, you know, really to like, you know, get blood flowing. But what may be even greater for them is where they can move with their loved ones. So they're getting like the emotional uh, aspect of being around people. And I'm not sure if you've, into this at all but like grounding and earthing i'm super into it like i'm into the whole bear i'm on the barefoot train yep. i, I yep. train barefoot with my athletes i expose myself to earth every day and i i don't encourage my athletes to start running barefoot but i do encourage them to spend time outdoors on earth because if it doesn't do anything then okay they spend some time outdoors if it does do something fantastic same thing mm -hmm. with sleep like literally a half an hour before our uh, zoom before our podcast one of my clients sent me a message he's like how do i sleep and I'm like, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that question, but here's a seven minute voice note on it. So I said, you know, give yourself a caffeine curfew, get off computers and, and uh, yeah. phones late at night, do some meditation before bed. And, and he's like, yeah, I never sleep. I said, great. So you're not coming into morning sessions anymore until we, until we get your sleep hack. Cause what's the point of beating yourself up in the gym? If you're not, if you're not going to get, you know, your good seven, eight hours of sleep a night. Mm hmm. I, I love that. And everything you're talking about is just keeping things as simple as possible. <laughs> and when, when you're working with youth athletes, simplicity is the highest form of sophistication. And when we, when we go outside into nature, that's where all of our answers are. That's where healing is movement, sunlight, uh, earthing, walking around barefoot, connecting with other people. That's where we feel the most in our power and, and healed and, and relaxed. And, you know, we, we could dive into the rabbit hole of, oh, well, are there research studies on this? And yeah. it's like, no, like, like, look at how humans evolved. <laughs> and we've, we've evolved because of, of movement and sunlight and, and getting our rest and eating uh, nutrient dense and protein rich foods. Uh, we can even get into fasting, but I don't talk about that for youth athletes, but for myself, yeah. abs absolutely he huge health benefits there. But um, now that I'm in year nine of my career, it's like, I'm resorting back to being more simple in my approach. Um, when I was in, in my early years and starting to like build myself as a coach, I was like, oh, I want to go to this like fancy performance facility with all these like gadgets and tools and data and tech and all this. And now I'm just like, I don't really need that that much because I, I look back into like the 90s as an example when 
you know, we were just going outside, we were playing, we were playing flag football with the neighbors or baseball or dodgeball or hide and seek and just moving and, and connecting. We all still developed into great athletes. And, and the, the greats right now, like Michael Jordan, Messi, um, even like me, me and Ham, they live that simple, carefree childhood outside. <laughs> and it's like, why now in 2021, are we trying to go against that? Why are we trying to do the opposite of that when we have all these success stories and these case studies? Um, so I just find it really interesting. And I, I just like to keep things as simple as possible now and to really teach these kids too that it, it is simple and you guys have control of your performance and your internal health and it's really easy to execute it doesn't mean it's it's not going to be hard you got to be consistent with it but it's really really that simple <laughs> Ooh, i couldn't help but think of when you were saying like gadgets so whenever i walk into like a top tier strength conditioning facility i think of you know the little mermaid song like i've got gadgets and gizmos yeah, yeah. <laughs> like i see all the like um, electrons that they attach to the athlete as they perform a jump yeah. and like reaction <laughs> lights. And don't get me wrong, those are freaking cool. In fact, I own many of these gadgets, but for my yeah. facility, I, I run a small strength conditioning facility here, but like, let, let's take a step back. Simple is super good and it's super efficient, especially for youth athletes. I think that athletic development is over, what's the word, not oversimplified. Um, Help me out here. Complicated. Over, over complex for youth athletes. Literally take the kid, give him like a kettlebell and say, walk. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Move, <laughs> yeah. like as simple as it sounds, like you, most people don't really learn how to walk. So here, take something heavy and squat with it. Take something heavy and push it over your head in a good, in a good manner. Take some heavy, take a walk. It's so simple. And the only real time I would think that you have to delve into the complex com complexities of training is when you're dealing with a fully mature, fully developed, advanced D1 level athlete who's about to like get accepted to the NFL or, or you know, what's the soccer equivalent of the NFL? Um, we have the women's league, we right. have EPL, there's so many. <laughs> right, so I'm saying like, whatever, getting to like professional sport or Olympics, okay, fine, this dude's advanced, he can, he or she can squat his body weight, twice his body weight, okay, let's do the fancy shit with him, right? But for most people, even I, and I work with like professional athletes who play for Team Israel, they're not at that level. So, hey, let's take it a yeah. step back and let's simplify things and let's get stronger. Let's get more powerful. Let's teach them how to jump and land. Like first thing, someone comes into my gym. First, first step, I teach them how to land. Because, and, and I explain to them why. Yeah. This guy or girl, they want to play baseball, basketball. I say every time you, 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 you jump or shoot a ball or catch or kick, you're landing. And if you can't land correctly, what does it matter if I can squat 100 kilo? Or what does it matter if I'm the best goalie that the world has? Once they learn how to land, which is like a basic human function, let's learn how to jump. And from there, it's just, you know, load the things slowly and progressively over time. And uh, what I did want to mention regarding fasting. So I wrote it down as a like memo to talk to you about it because yeah. I saw one of your posts about fasting and I right away connected the dots like either for intermittent fasting purposes or for spiritual practice or for both and fasting is amazing because it's one of the things that can carry over to both things it it does improve body composition it can help with uh you know food and stuff obviously all youth athletes listening please don't fast please eat yeah, yummy don't. not for youth athletes <laughs> yeah please <laughs> <For> college eat. <laughs> athletes <laughs> especially with like um uh, a future episodes going to be at eating disorders i've done like a couple of episodes about mental health mm -hmm. fasting yeah. is a very very dark hole that not all of us are physically capable of going down but right. if fasting is an option there's numerous effects on body composition and nutrition effects and there's also like the spiritual practice of you know abstaining from physical i guess pleasures is the right word to an extent Yes. And yes. So it kind of checks off both boxes. Uh, yeah. So go ahead. Fasting on you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get in that soon because I want to come back to what you mentioned about the maturity of the kid. And I, I think it's great that like, you're not really loading them or putting through the more advanced complicated stuff until they are fully mature. Mm -hmm. And we can look at maturity from a physical standpoint, but also the mental standpoint. And, you know, while you can measure a nine-year-old's broad jump or, you know, measure their like pull-up max, whatever mm -hmm. it is, they're not 
emotionally ready for that. Like nine-year-olds aren't ready to be like tracked and tested. They just, they just want to have fun and enjoy the moment and, and play and be carefree. So yes, we, we can measure them, but, but there's no need. And people have to understand the, the emotional needs of, of the kids as well. And it's funny, I had a, a dad the other day uh, ask me, he's like, for, for nine-year-old boys, he asked me, well, how do you measure progress? And I, you know, it's not to, um, like hate on what he was saying because a lot of parents you know they're they're just curious and they are just what they just want to be educated and I said to him I was like I don't evaluate boys until they're in middle school and right now my progress tracking is are they smiling are they laughing after sessions um and are they just you know generally moving in a way that is is quick and efficient and these are things that we can see over time and we can't discredit the coach's eye either uh, when, when we're watching kids and especially with like nine-year-olds or younger kids it's like you see how they're doing when you put them in these like new environments or you had them play a, a new game or do a new competition and you can see okay are they thinking quickly and are they adjusting and that I think that the coach's eye is just as valuable and they're also kids. So it's not like I'm going to have a bunch of data on them. Um, but once we hit middle school, uh, like you said, teaching them how to decelerate and control their landing. And then when they're in like seventh or eighth grade, then it's like, okay, we're going to measure a broad jump or a vertical jump and, and see where they're at. And then reevaluate that in, in their high school years, once they start to load and develop the muscle strength to have more power output. Um, so that's when it comes back to the physical maturity side of it. Now fasting. <laughs> so yes, uh, youth athletes listening, don't uh, pay attention, but I was thought when I tweeted this, I was talking more about just coach health. Um, and um, I do it not for weight loss. And I think a lot of people look at fasting because they're like, oh yeah, I just want to lose weight. Like, mm -hmm. and I'm like, you're going to quit on day two, my friend, you know, <laughs> um, you have to have that greater reason to want to do it and really look at the, the science behind it. Um, as far as just your, your brain health. And I do it more for, for mental clarity and to have more energy. Um, so right now I'm, I'm fat in a fasted state and I usually just am in a fasted state in my mornings because that's when I'm doing like my most focused and articulate work and the, the benefits for me mentally have been huge, but then, you know, the, the body composition just follows mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, that's a nice byproduct of it, of course. Um, but also for, for spiritual reasons and just, you know, not giving yourself pleasures right away or um, over consuming. And um, I found in terms of health, like sometimes cutting out things is for your benefit, um, you know, fasting or um, cutting out social media or uh, alcohol. I don't drink anymore. So that's, that's been huge for me, but you have to have a deeper reason to fast. And I think all coaches should explore it, especially if you're in a very demanding job. It's really good for mental clarity. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, on that topic, the biggest advice I would give to uh, an athlete who's worried about body composition or, you know, um, you know, fat loss or whatever is first of all, love yourself unconditionally. Like before you go in the weight room, before you start looking in the mirror, say, hey, you're special, you're unique. You Like that's the first step of like uh, self-acceptance before you even go on the diet road, which I don't even like the word diet. But right. <laughs> honestly, honestly, and, and, I, and I've had amazing success with this, both with myself and my clients and athletes, focus more on performance. And as you said, the body composition will come. If you're constantly getting stronger and faster and better and better at your sport, your body's gonna adapt to your regimen and obviously don't eat like donuts all day unless they're really good donuts and maybe you know have them in your in your uh yes. regimen. but like the more you focus on weight loss the more it becomes this you know endless journey of black of a black hole that you never go back and a lot of times if you overtrain and then under eat it just turns into like this endless cycle of eating disorders um you know muscle damage never recovering properly from workouts and it's just uh oh more ice is coming <laughs> oh no Okay. Okay. It's, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. Um, sorry. I went off track for a second. The more you go down the, the, the calorie restriction road, 
the more it's going to harm you in the long run. Whereas the more we go down the performance road, the better you're going to feel, the stronger you're going to be. And on that being said, you know, Instagram, Facebook, you also said about cutting off social media. They're giving us this constant image, not just of aesthetics, but actually performance aesthetics. Like you see these athletes doing this ridiculous shit, even coaches, like many coaches are guilty of like, do this like side reverse lunge pivot jerk combo passing a kettlebell between your legs and I'm like how about I just do a regular lunge with them I think that'd be just as efficient so like a hundred pound lunge or something (laughs) yeah it it, it gives them like a false reality both you know of physical capacity and of how their body should look when in reality if we focus on our own journey and over time progress on our in the in the gym on the field you know the 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 pounds will come off and we'll 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 be well forget about the pounds come off or not but we'll be functional we'll be performing and it doesn't really matter if someone weighs 100 pounds or weighs 120 pounds or 180 pounds 190 pounds if they're performing at the very best you know their coaches are going to they're 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 gonna be fine they're gonna dominate their sport and obviously if weight is a problem then you know there's nutritionists there's psychologists where we coaches are the the mentor for them but if we have to pass them on to a specialist who can help them you know with the emotional or psychological side of things you know we, we, I, I would do that as a coach as well um other point i wanted to mention you mentioned about fasting i forgot what i wanted to mention at this moment so I'll pass it back to you with some reflection of what I said, and it will will come to me. Okay. Yeah, well, you you mentioned um, overtraining and undereating, and uh, that has been the biggest issue I've observed, especially in young female athletes. And you know, there's, there's so many reasons for this. I mean, it could be pressure coming from the coach or the parent to lose weight. And we have to be very careful of the language that we use. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the, the focus needs to be performance. So if you're a coach or a parent, um, instead of saying, oh, well, you need to lose weight or you need to cut back on your body fat. Uh, let's, let's build your total body strength. Let's make sure your, your bone and bones and tendons and ligaments are, are durable enough to handle the, the year round grind. Let's make sure that you are fueled enough so that you're supporting your muscle recovery and your growth and your energy levels and, uh, energy and just overall feeling are the two things that I always mention to the girl to pay attention to. So if if your energy levels are chronically low or your mood is always oscillating and you just feel off, then something needs to be changed. So you need to change your environment, whether it's recovering more or nourishing and fueling your body more. And those are usually the two that, that need to be fixed. And coming back to just social media, it is hard because a lot of girls are comparing their bodies to other athletes or just other celebrities. But it's also, and I posted this this morning before we got on, social media is also distracting us from ourselves and how we feel. Uh, the majority of humanity has no clue what they're feeling right now or what they need you know and and it makes sense because everyone's constantly distracted and just stimulated by something outside of themselves that they forget themselves so most people don't know that they're underhydrated they're they're undernourished they're underfueled they're underrested they're they're overstimulated always stressed out they don't know this because they're paying attention to something else and they're not paying attention to themselves so I've been just trying to reinforce to all my girls, you need to take time away from tech. And I'm going to be annoying with this message. Like you guys start with 30 minutes a day, then bump it up to 45, then go to an hour, like see how long you can go and listen to your body and what it needs. And what it's also going to do is it's going to give your brain a break from wanting to always think about something. And a lot of them always complain, oh, well, coach Erica, like I'm always overthinking or I don't want to make mistakes. and I'm always getting performance anxiety. And my solution is start with getting off tech. <laughs> That's like a classic example of something that they'll, they won't teach it to you in training school. They won't nope. teach it to you in any strength and conditioning seminar, but I totally agree with you. It's one of the most, one of the most destructive habits we have as humans. 
And, you know, both yeah. of us, I, I'm not sure your age, I won't ask, but both of us grew up in, I assume both of us grew up in an era without cell phones. Like 90s, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 90s, baby. Yeah. This shit didn't exist. Like we didn't have all these, we had maybe, 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 I remember vaguely, We like at some point in my child to teenage I had like the flip phone that had like this big antenna or something like that but we yeah, didn't have this yeah. techno- we didn't have these distractions so accessible now I'm gonna like jump back into fasting for a second then jump back into the uh Instagram Facebook trap so one of my clients yeah. is a very devout Christian and he was saying to me that Christians have a month of perhaps you're more familiar with this I'm, I'm Jewish so I don't know so much about Christianity but they have a month of where they're supposed to be abstaining from something similar to how Muslims have Ramadan and yep. he was like, yeah, some people fast. And I said, what about fasting from like like technology? What about like taking a month off Facebook? He's like, yeah, many people do that. So yeah. in today's yeah. day and age, and once again, this is a topic for maybe later on in the podcast or a different episode, but religion and spirituality are not the same thing. But if someone wants to be spiritual and connect to, you know, the higher power or connect or just, you know, take a break, taking a week or taking even a few hours in the day off social media is a form of fasting, you know, abstaining yourself from yes. something that, you get yeah i'm speaking your language right i saw like that yeah, well there. i call it the it's the the dopamine detox yeah that's yeah that's what it is and you know dopamines it's it's the the seeking part of you and like when you stop you know scrolling or looking for likes or you know this next thing this next thing it's like you know you can return back to your creativity and the the present moment and that's like the most powerful or the the flow state to to be in so yeah it's like you know, social media fasting is powerful very yeah. powerful <laughs> i love to use the word flow state I, I i use the word like creative energy a lot but i'm gonna forget what i wanted to say before so i'm just gonna jump back into it um, <laughs> we're all over the place it's yeah <laughs> it's it's like a coach thing like i feel like sometimes my mind is worrying at like seventeen thousand cogs a minute and that's yeah, probably yeah. largely due to Facebook and Instagram. Like it puts you in this state of like next, next, next engagement, next interaction, next. And it's like, bro, that's not how life works. You know, everything's slow. That's what nature, that's why nature yes. is so good. It's the, yes. the nature is the polar. <laughs> the Yo, so, so I have a tattoo uh, on my ribs of Lao Tzu. And his quote is, nature does not hurry, yet everything is accomplished. Nice. So it's like this mind blowing quote. And it's like, wow, like nature's so beautiful, but it, it takes its time, man. <laughs> nature is the, I would say the exact opposite of social media. Like I went uh, yesterday, yeah. <laughs> I was, I, I'm okay. One second backtracking. And then I'm going to come back to this in a second. Cool. So <laughs> back to fasting for a moment, for those out there who do want like the effects of fa- physical fasting as an abstaining from food without, you know, it, killing your day so there's the easy like 16 hour fasting which means you have some sort of you know cutoff point you know let's say you have dinner at like 6 7 p.m you sleep that's already eight to ten hours of fasting then you skip breakfast then you have lunch and you you or you he she it they wait when where who where then will probably uh not even feel it because all you're doing is skipping breakfast now to get into the like physiological stuff of it there is also benefits of training fasted. I did a bunch of like random research on this. Yes. I, yes. Yeah. I usually start my day training fasted. Now, some days it will be more of like a light walk with my dog, Charlie, or some movement, some mobility, slash yoga, some meditation. And other days will be the training hard and heavy. When I'm training hard and heavy. So there is the, there's two concepts happening there. One is that there, it, there may or may not be some advanced, you know, uh, uh, there may or may, there may be some advanced muscle breakdown if you're training in a fast state, especially, you know, if you're doing rigorous strength training. Uh, there also may be accelerated fat loss when training in a fasted state. So there's, I'm not super into supplement, especially as I explore my journey as a human being, I'm much more likely to eat whole nutritious foods rather than jump to supplements. And of course, youth athletes out there, please eat your mama's home cooked chicken dinner. Don't jump yeah. to, don't jump to like creatine quite yet. We're talking about yeah. youth athletes. But if I'm like feeling, you know, tired already and I do want to maintain the fasted state, there is benefits of having like, I did some studies in this, some BCAAs or, or EAAs, you know, some sort of amino acid or even like 10 grams of a protein shake or just something to maintain the fasted state while training. So people out there who want to try it, give it a shot. You, it won't even affect you that, you know, negative. You won't feel that you're like missing food. That was regarding um, physically fasting. Now, regarding social media. So as a human being, I realize social media drains me i have this concept that i made up called creative energy and i think that every human out there 
has a, f- is the word finite or finite? Yes, yes. Which one? Finite? Finite. <laughs> so I believe that every human has this like finite amount of creative energy. Now, if they're going to wake up and, you know, spend half an hour on social media, they drain the quarter of it. Then they go to work and they work, they slave away for someone else. They hate their job. They're sitting all day in front of a computer. They drained another chunk of it. Then they go home and they maybe, maybe have willpower to work out maybe. And they drained another chunk of it. And they just have no time or patience for fulfilling their dream or doing anything. On the other hand, if the first thing you do when you wake up is like, spend time with loved ones or go outside in nature, you're actually increasing your ability to create. This, this, this willpower, creative energy meter just gets bigger and bigger. And when you journal, you're creating, you're creating life to your thoughts. When you, even like uh, my wife just started taking up crocheting. So, uh, so she like knits stuff. She's physically creating something as opposed to Facebook or Instagram, which like just drains you. It takes, sucks your energy away. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. So what I started doing is every month I do like a like a monk week of sorts where it's three to five days off social media, which sucks because Instagram and Facebook are our lifelines to an extent as coaches. You know, you advertise your stuff there. I never would have met you if I didn't see your your awesome Instagram. But even as coaches, you know, we're human beings. And something I learned from uh, someone I follow, the Foot Collective, uh, he lives in Canada, yes. is that he'll post about it. He'll be like, hey, guys, taking a monk week, been out, been real. So you, you can tap into his journey. And it's not like, oh, how come he hasn't posted in two weeks? Not that anyone really cares. No one's really, uh, hey, he or she didn't post in a week. Where'd she go? But uh, as Jews, we do have the Sabbath, which is essentially like, as you know, I, I'm not strictly observant, but. Sabbath is a time where there's no electronics. So no phones, no computers, no lights. And we like cook food in advance. You just have a 24 hour reset, just time to spend with loved ones. Obviously everyone can take that where they want it. But for me, it's been a blessing to no work. My phone's off, leave me alone world. And whenever I need a longer extended break off social media, I do that like three to five monk week. And I'll usually do a three to five hike along with it to kind of counter all the computer toxins I've been exposed to. And this is something I encourage all people to do, not just athletes, but athletes need it more because we're always beating up our bodies. So we need as much positive energy in our life as possible. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Everything you said is just so good. I don't even like know where to begin, but (sighs) I'm like, I, I love that, that you mentioned that social media, just it's an energy sucker. Um, like even if, you know, even if you're following accounts, like, you know, when we're connecting with each other or we're following like coaches we love or role models, like, yeah, like that's great. And we're getting positive information that serves us, but we're still stimulating our nervous system and we're still like getting that, that dopamine hit. So we, we have to take a a break from that for our, our creativity And I'm starting to have um, like flashbacks to when I lived in Brazil for a year. And a lot of people would say, oh, well, Brazil, you know, they're, they're not that civilized. And it's like, well, define, define civilized. And uh, not a lot of people can give me an answer. Um, And I, and I really think like here in the States, we're like over civilized to death. Like we're over consuming, we're overeating, we're over stressing, Uh, you know, we're just, constantly wanting like more when it's just coming back to like when we like really need to take things away for our health and when I lived in Brazil I had taken a trip out to the the Amazon jungle and it was one of the most enriching times of my life just being in nature for that long and just being in the quiet and in the sun and you know just moving my body every day like fishing like getting food uh, eating bugs, you know, like crazy stuff. Um, got the best sleep I've ever gotten in my life. Um, probably because we were just so in tune with our circadian rhythms and just the the rise of the sun and, and the sunset. But it's it's interesting when people look at different countries and cultures, they judge and they're like, oh, well, that country is not good enough because they don't have, you know, the iPhone 12. And it's like, well, like, what, what do you value more? Do you value being overstimulated and constantly seeking pleasure all the time? Or do you value being back in the present moment and living through your, your creative energy? So I always found that, that very interesting. <laughs> um, for, for those who struggle with social media and you know, are too scared to take the leap of taking a day off because at the end of the day, it's addicting. And it's tough to take the day off, take the week off. Mm-hmm. So something that worked for me as well, especially for 
you know, uh, coaches and health professionals such as us who use it primarily for marketing and getting our content out there. So it's tough just to quit completely. So what I try doing is either one of two options. Either I give myself like a daily quota where it's like, all right, you have 10 minutes on Instagram today. If, the, if it takes seven minutes to, you know, make your post, assuming it's edited already, you have three minutes to see what, you know, Erica has to say today or whatever it is. Also, another tip I do is I only follow people on Instagram who I can get value from. Now, that sounds kind of selfish, yeah. but it's either close friends or people who educate me. So the next yeah. time some woman dressed in who knows what shows up, like, get off my feed, man. I, I want to yeah, I want to yeah. be educated. I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to be seeing some stupid gimmicky, whatever or something. So I'm pretty picky about who I follow that people who I can empower me who learn from or people who I you know connect with in person. That helps me as well. That way it minimizes distraction. And the time quota thing has done me wonders like it turns instead of checking it like 17 times a day to Ooh, did someone comment on my post to give me boom a, a dopamine fix did someone right. message me did someone tag me in their story did someone blah blah blah? it's like all right twice a day is around the limit i don't yeah. even do it in the morning anymore i first do my spiritual practice which is meditation journaling taking the dog out cold exposure too much stuff at once but yeah. then i'll work <laughs> then i'll work out then i my post was usually edited the day before then i'll upload my post i'll hang out for a few minutes if you know someone comments so I click reply to them or someone messages me and then in the evening I'll check it again and that it gives you that it gives you the dopamine you need without it taking over your life and it's it's a struggle you know as I'm a human being who struggles and that's okay and yeah. yeah I I love that and um I was thinking like about just like your methods but like taking a break in like certain time pockets like mm -hmm. maybe like an hour or two hours a day where you just like don't check your phone at all and just like start really small and like, you don't need to check if you get comments or, or likes right away, like right. approach it from an abundance mindset. They're always going to be there. Like, they're not going to like disappear if you don't check your notifications right away. Like they'll be there the next day. And then you can get back to someone's comment or see how many likes you got. Like it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It's always going to be there. Um, and then another thing I was thinking was if, if parents truly want their kids to excel in their sports, these are some of the hard things they're going to have to execute. And I think everyone's under the impression, well, I just need to hire, you know, the next skills trainer, or this amazing speed guru. And it's about the trainer. And it's really about the daily habits that they're doing at home. And I've written a blog on this. It was like unconventional ways, like young athletes can get an edge because everyone wants to get an edge, you know? And what, one of them was drink your bone broth, <laughs> uh, meditate daily, get, and get off tech and really dial in on your sleep. And if you can master those daily and also get in your nourishment, but if you can master those daily as a young athlete, then you are potent. You know, like you, you are like outdoing all of your neighbors, like, because none of these kids know these, I would consider these secrets nowadays, but yeah. a lot of kids aren't doing these things. So if people really want to get an edge and feel energized and fulfilled and motivated and focused and creative in their sport, do these things. It's also because it's not taught in school. No. We're not taught this in courses. We're not taught this. I, I, I'm also writing a book as well. And like the book is going to be with a lot of those. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah. It's going to like a lot of those hacks, like the things that they don't mention in, in school, take your shoes off, go move more, spend some time in sunshine. The book's going to be called the active couch potato. It's going to be a fun. Uh, oh, I love that. Yeah. Let me know when it's out. I, de I definitely will. It's going to be a fun <laughs> yeah. read, but like we expect kids to sit for eight, eight hours a day in school with half mm -hmm. an hour of recess. I think it should be the opposite. I think we should move for eight hours, learn things more hands-on. Like you wanna learn math, build a house and you'll learn the angles very nicely. And then maybe half an hour of like sitting on the floor learning to read and write and you know, those basic skills. And kids are constantly like pushed to fit in this box, but they're not meant to be. Kids are supposed to be exploring themselves, hanging out, going on the monkey bars. It goes back to yeah. movement. A kid, yeah. should, a kid should not be just playing baseball. They should be playing baseball, jumping in the park, frolicking, frisbeeing, monkey barring, and, you know, pulling, pushing thing. And it's only because our flaws of the 20th century that we have to teach them the fundamental movement patterns in the gym, instead of it being that it's something that they picked up on their own because they were hunting down mountain lions to eat for dinner. 
or whatever right, it was. Right. <laughs> there, That's so true. <laughs> there is there is a book by uh, Katie Bowman called Move Your DNA. Have you ever read it? I have not. I'll have to check that I'll out. Check it. It's a good read. Uh, now, um, I'm a performance coach, so I don't inherently agree with everything she says because at the end of the day, the disclaimer is both you and I are training athletes to perform better at their sport. So if you want to perform better at soccer, you have to kick a ball around and you have to get faster and, you know, do a lot of, and learn how to change direction. So you can't just like sit in a squat position and grind your herbs from your garden that you grew for your tea. But her like concept is like an African tribe. The kid's moving from like one years old. He's not being carried in a sling. He's being carried around in, in their hands. So instead of being like a bassinet, which supports him, his core has his core in his neck. He spoke about concussions. Yeah. Has to adapt to the like running of his father and mother as they hunt food. And then when he's two years old, he's already learned to walk. He he's already perfected the squat at two years old, and he keeps it. He's foraging and rummaging berries. He or she at a young age, and he's always active. Like you don't have to go work out because his whole life is movement. Now that approach could work for like what a friend of mine calls a NARP, a non-athletic regular person. But if you want to yeah. get good at, if you want to get good at a sport, you do have to, you know, do some specialization training. But just as humans, yeah. and with this, I think we can move on to like the next topic. We have to move more. As yeah. humans, we have to move more. Now, I don't mean play seventeen sports. I mean, I have a pomegranate tree right in front of me. Go to the tree, pick a pomegranate, and eat it. You just got a triple extension step up and got an overhead, uh, whatever you want to call it, overhead pull down, but. It's not that complicated. All I did was pick a fruit from the tree, right? Yeah. So movement, yeah. Talk to me. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking like what I've read as far as like neuroscience. And I don't know if you've heard of the book Spark, um, but it's it's just an amazing book on why humans need movement <laughs> for their brains. Um, so, so when you do something as simple as like walking or cross crawling for, for babies, you are activating the the left and right hemisphere of your brain and they're they're working together and you're not just dominated by by one side so movement's very powerful for your ability to think and to to do your work and it's it's something that is is going to be a part of these kids lives even when they're done playing sports they still have to move and they still have to be healthy. And it's it's not enough to just walk every day. Like I truly believe when you're done playing sports or even if you didn't play sports at all, you should be an athlete for life. And you should be able to build your muscles uh, in your 50s, 60s and 70s so that you're not getting knee or hip replacements. This is a, a continuous athletic journey for everyone. And um, I actually, I used to train senior citizens early in my career uh, while I was training kids at the same time. And they were some of the most inspiring people I've worked with because they just wanted to be able to walk to their mailbox without tripping over themselves or, or falling. And, you know, no one was there to help them because maybe they're living alone and they, you know, their uh, companion passed away, what, whatever it is, like people need to learn to still take care of themselves, um, for, for their longevity and, and their strength. And that's why it's, it's important for, for kids to get them started young on their movement journey. Um, and I always say to my boyfriend, like, once I become a parent, like, my kids are going to be the most freaking active and nourished <laughs> kids out there. Like, you know, like just knowing what I know about the, the impacts on health and, and their brain and, and everything in, in their lives. It's, it's huge. So I, I highly recommend people check out the book spark and then the book uh, smart moves is, is really good. And then um, the athletic skills model is also an amazing read for, for youth movement, um, neuroscience, and just overall ath athletic development. Yeah, I mean, movement and moving your body in a full range of motion as much as possible should never have been a let's teach a mobility class. It should have been a fundamental primal thing that came with us. We lost it in the era of sitting in front of computers yeah. sitting in front of TV, sitting on our phones, slouched over, and we kind of have to undo the damage before we can even delve into the advanced things. Disclaimer time, I'm at like the 50 minute ice bath mark. This is when, 
This is when like my brain slows down a bit. Like I'm almost breaking my record. My record is 60 minutes and it's been like 54 minutes. So uh, we'll break my oh, record. Wow. This, yeah, we'll break my, it's not that cold. Cause it's like, a, it's more of like a springy day but I did add a lot of ice before. So we'll be fun. Um, so I'm like moving a lot, trying to like, you know, prevent, like I'm going from a squat to kneeling to lunging. That's why I'm like moving so much, but no, anyways, you're good. Yeah. Anyways, regarding movement. So this is, doesn't just apply to youth athletes. I think it applies to professional, you know, elite athletes as well. The three to five to 10, whatever amount of gym sessions you're doing, plus the field work, that's all important. And that's what I call high intensity specific work. This work is meant to, you know, make you better, whether it's make you stronger, make you more powerful, uh, reaction time, rate of force development, you know, multilinear development, whatever it is. These are all things that are high impact. So you can't, you can't, you know, beat yourself up in the gym five hours. Of, I'm starting to shiver a bit. I'm good. One second. You're good. <laughs> By the way, I have to yeah. leave in like 10 minutes if yeah, that's sweet. okay. No, but, yeah, of okay. course. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap break up. your record. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, just, just deep, like, yeah. deep diaphragm breath. Anyways, the high impact <laughs> stuff you're going to need to recover from, you can't be, you know, beating yourself up in the gym five, 10 hours a day. The low impact okay. stuff, like walking, playing with your kids, walking your dog, frisbee, slacklining, volleyball, whatever you're into, the more the merrier. Now, I don't mean hike 20 hours a day because they'll probably impact your body's uh, ability to recover from the high impact stuff. But if you're constantly moving in, in the light flow, you go from sitting to standing to kneeling, you know, sitting less on the couch, taking your shoes off, taking your shoes off more and taking the things away that restrict mobility. You're actually constantly increasing your body's ability to recover. So my methodology evolved as a coach. One second, sorry. Just like shivering a bit. My methodology evolved as a coach from like, all right, let's get your workouts. Let's get three sets of six and let's go up away and go home and go do whatever you want. It's like, Hey, how about instead of driving to me, start walking to me? And how about, you know, when you go out tonight to that event, I know it's going to be a three hour event, you know, every like half an hour, get up and take a small walk. And I also like in the past two years, I haven't, haven't worn any sort of tight constricted shoe. I own 18 pairs of barefoot shoes, shoe addict. I don't sit on couches anymore. I do all my programming work. I use train heroic on the floor. Uh, yeah. I ice bath every day. I rarely sit. I spend a lot of time walking barefoot. In addition to my gym sessions every week, I'm always, I'm sl I slack line every day. I frisbee, like I incorporated yeah. movement practice. And what's cool is that even if I never did another gym session in my life, I would still be strong. I would still be fast. I would still be athletic because movement, not gym, not strength training, the movement, movement yeah. is now part of my lifestyle. And I've been able to carry that over to my athletes as well. It's just been a blessing. I, I love that. And those are just like, again, those like small daily practices that just, they compound over time into your, your movement and, and the health of your body and, and the piggy bank of, of your strength. And I think it's important for people to realize that it's simple. Um, just coming back to the simplicity of it. Like you don't need like this fancy gym or this crazy membership or this like new like workout routine or what whatever it is um you just need variety of movement walking sitting on the floor standing up with no hands from the floor walking barefoot uh climbing trees um just hobbies you enjoy golfing biking just move you know and i think the the general rule of thumb from a serbian neuroscientist is move six to eight miles a day that, accumulate that like yeah. That. Yeah. So I guess if people have Fitbits and we're tracking steps, that's probably over like 15,000 steps, I mm -hmm. assume. So just to put things into perspective, that's what humans need daily, all, all ages. I don't care who you are. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll say like ages six and up. <laughs> even if, even if someone's not an athlete, the end goal for them should be when I'm 80 years old, am I going to be able to, I mean, it doesn't have to be, but this is how I would see it. Am I going to be able to pick my grandkid above my head? Am I going to be able to lead by example when I take my son or grandson or granddaughter to the park and like show them how to use the monkey bars? Or am I going to be that guy or girl, you know, in the wheelchair, incapable? And th those are the athletic goals for a regular human being. You know, you don't have to be the most muscly dude or do that on the planet. You don't have to be the fastest, but you do need, you do want to have a full range of motion and have healthy functioning body that you can lead by example. Uh, yeah. Another concept that I also like adding is journaling. 
Uh, I find it very helpful both for myself and for athletes. Like if something's on their mind, I'll literally stop the strength session. Like stop the squat and hey, you know, here's here's your, you know, take your notebook out, write it there, write down your emotions, what's bothering you. And that's kind of the emotional training that once again, not mentioned in the courses, not mentioned in uh, anywhere. Uh, let's wrap up because, you know, I'm getting cold and you probably have to go enjoy the sunny <laughs> summer skies. But can you tell us where we can find you, what you like a little bit more about what you do? Meaning your website, your Instagram, your Facebook, your, your programs that you potentially offer. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Fit Soccer Queen, and my website is ericasuter.com. So if you head to my Instagram or Twitter, the link is in my bio, and you can get online training there. You can get free content like blogs and exercise videos. So there's definitely something there for everyone. Wow. So Erica, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the episode. Uh, I had a feeling we'd connect just from like, yeah. I think we have the same exact philosophy in different parts of the world. So thank you for spending your time with me in the, almost in the ice bath. And uh, yeah, looking forward to future collaborations. Yeah, me too, Sean. I, I knew this would be great. And th this is, was probably one of my favorite conversations so far. Amazing. So I'm like really excited for this to get out there. And I really can't wait to share it with my audience. Hell yeah. All right. Awesome. Have an amazing weekend full of happiness and love. And I'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.